so we're talking about those who don't ever, they're not reached with the gospel. That's, what, that, that's the, the people we're talking about tonight. So first of all, let's just say, uh, articulate some ways that you share the gospel. Um, so the gospel answers the question, how can I, Anna, good to see you. The gospel answers the question, how can I, a sinful person, be reconciled to God? How do you, let's get a couple of, of ways you articulate the gospel to people. It can be very simplistic. Yes. Maybe do like a, uh, like a one-on-one time, like during lunch, or like the, to go out and get coffee and talk about the words. Of and, and, but what, what exactly is... What we're, what we're after is, so how would you articulate the gospel if they said, how can I be saved? <laughs> they might say that. So any, Katie? I mean, I grew up hearing this like acronym, God, our sins, paying everyone's life, where the idea was basically the gospel is God paid for your sins, and if you believe in Christ, your sins will be forgiven and you can be with him. <coughs> right. That covers it, right? Any other any other ways that you um, articulate the gospel? Oh, come on now! If you put your faith in Jesus and His righteousness, then He takes your sin on Himself, and He dies the death you deserve, and you get the life that He deserved. Very, very nice. This is how, uh, very, very good. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of ways you can cover all the points of the gospel is all I'm saying. Um, here, here's what I've said is the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was raised from the dead according to the scriptures and he now offers forgiveness of sins, the indwelling Holy Spirit and eternal life to all who repent and believe. Does that sound about right? Covers it? The next question, and I just took that from, summarize those verses. So who are we talking about tonight? Who are the unevangelized? What do, what do I mean, what do you and I mean when we say the uneva- unevangelized? For our purposes tonight, I'm not talking about unreached people in the Old Testament or pre-Christ incarnation. We're going to talk for just so we can limit it. Our purpose is I'm talking about persons post-Christ who never hear about Jesus. Now, um, the International Congress on World Evangelism meets this year for the fourth time. And uh, that it began, the Congress began in 1971 as an evangelical Protestant movement to call attention to people in the world with little or no access to the gospel. And some countries, of course, as you know, restrict sharing the gospel and even restrict having Bibles in their country. North Korea, Saudi Arabia would be one. Um, The largest unreached people groups are in what's called the 1040 window. You may have heard that term. It's just between, it's the region between 10 and 40 degrees north latitude. It's that little rectangle on the the, um, slide. Um, So... There are roughly, get ready, how many of you think unreached people? You think? Give it a shot. Two billion. Ten billion. Three point two. What did you say? Three point two billion, roughly. But did you know that 1.2 million students study in the U.S.? that come, and many come from this 1040 window countries. So they come here to study at A&M and in your disciplines. And um, then uh, lots of times when they're done, they go back to their home country, right? So we have an opportunity. Do you ever interact with um, international students that you think probably had never heard the gospel in their home country? Do you have international students in your classes? I know there's a lot of graduate students that are international. I see people shaking heads. Yeah, Katie, I'm sure you do too. Um, So just keep that in mind as we go along because uh, instead of you going to the unreached people, they're actually coming to A&M. 
So we might want to think about befriending them and sharing the gospel. <clears throat> so we often use Alvin the atheist, who's our friend, and Carol the Christian, who's also our friend, to talk about these uh, questions. So Carol has shared the gospel, like we said, with Alvin, and this is his objection. He says, look, you say that hearing and responding to the gospel is necessary for salvation. But lots of people don't hear the gospel, and therefore they can't believe. And the fate of unbelievers is hell. Punishing people for what they couldn't have known is inconsistent with a loving and just God. So therefore, a loving and just God must not exist. So that's how he lays it out to Carol. And um, just so you know, this is not... He's not saying, giving a new objection. This, we, we could share with Alvin that it's a very good question he has and that it's been pondered and talked about for many millennia. But Carol, <clears throat> Carol doesn't know what to say because first of all, as you probably know, God doesn't say a lot about what he's going to do with unevangelism. He doesn't explicitly give us what he's doing in, in the scripture. He doesn't give us the black and white answer to this. So Carol says, we just don't know about the fate of the unevangelized. That's kind of her answer to Alvin. Do you think that's a helpful answer for Alvin? Well, one thing she adds is some scripture. She says, but you know, in Genesis 18, 25, it says, I can know that the judge of all the earth will do what's right. God is the judge of all the earth, and he's going to do what's right. So I trust in that. Okay, do you think that's helpful to Alvin? So Alvin doesn't believe in God, right? He's, and in fact, he doesn't even believe God is good or just. So this doesn't ring true to him and doesn't, in his soul, that's not a satisfying answer. Even though for Carol, it satisfies her because she already trusts in God, right? Um, so certainly her answer is not wrong because we don't know for sure what God has planned the fate for, of the unevangelized. So... Uh, her answer's not wrong, but it doesn't really help Alvin. And so tonight, what we want to do is craft a more thoughtful response that may help Alvin get past what seems to him is like a deal-breaker objection. He doesn't even want to listen to anything about the gospel because he has this problem about the inconsistency in Christianity. So... How would we do that if we don't know for sure? But there's lots of things in Christianity that are debatable that we don't know, but we have to kind of give some reasonable answer to, um, to especially people like Alvin. So our investigation is going to require critical thinking and namely abductive reasoning, or we're going to be inferring to the best explanation. And all that means is we know certain things and then we're challenged by claims that seem to be inconsistent to Christianity with what we know. And so we need to find a response that harmonizes the claims with the inconsistencies. Um, so to be clear, we should hold, however we land and however we all leave here, um, should we hold the, any, anything we come up with dogmatically? We shouldn't. We should probably be more tentative with, our, with how, we've, how we come to our conclusions, right? And even if you have a strong conviction, because you may settle and say, yeah, I'm really strongly convinced about this, this response, this view. I don't think that this should be a hill you want to die on. Do you know what I mean? So you can have a conviction, but uh, again, do you want this to be the hill you want to die on, this, this question of the unevangelized? Everybody? No. So this is not a hill to die on, but it's good that we have a reasonable response. Okay. So we're going to have a timeout <laughs> because when we talk about the unevangelized, we are also talking about hell. But we're not going to go through the views of hell tonight. I'm just going to tell you 
that there are differing views of hell, so that when you are considering these responses, in the back of your mind, you might say, well, I have this view of hell. I wonder how it fits in with my response about the unevangelized. So there are basically three broad views of hell. The very traditional view is eternal con conscious punishment. And that's a punitive view. The judgment is retribution. And the suffering is eternal. That, that would be how I would describe um, the traditional view of eternal con con conscious punishment. The next view is annihilationism you may have heard of. And for this, the punishment is not eternal, but it is destruction or perishing. Or, you know, those in hell will be ultimately destroyed after a period of punishment in hell. So on this view, eventually, ultimately, hell would be empty. That would be an annihilationist view of hell. Um, all unbelievers in hell, ultimately, after being after suffering, they cease to exist. The third view is universalism, and um, this view, it's, and all these views have been around for a really long time. Uh, all we we won't go in that into that tonight. But these aren't new views of hell. These are these are all established views of hell. So universalism is that. Hell is remedial. It's not, retri not retribution, but remedial, meaning um, every human being will finally, ultimately come to salvation. And hell will be empty. So on the last two, hell is empty, right? OK. Now, this is not a talk on hell, but we just <laughs> we wanted to throw this out because you may want to connect the dots a little bit as we're going through it, because obviously it factors into um, when, we, when we talk to Alvin, we might want to tell Alvin there's differing views of hell, too. He might, might not know that. So these are the resources I used. Um, they're all good. I, I really like the no other name, which the structure of it and the content and the, and the thoroughness of it, if you ever are interested in this a little bit more, um, you, can, you can borrow that from me. So let's, ha let's have a brief overview first of seven responses. The ones highlighted are the ones that we're actually going to dig deeper into. Now, how Carol responded first to, to Alvin is agnosticism, right? It's just saying we can't make any conclusions, definite conclusions about the unevangelized, because God simply hasn't told us. So this is a valid response. And actually, it, it satisfied me for a long time as a believer. But I mean, lately, probably only a couple of days a week does it satisfy me. So I, I, think, I think we can say more than, than this. Um, and remember, when you're talking to someone like a skeptic or an atheist, they don't believe in God. So you're asking them to trust God as judge, that he will do right and good. And they don't have any framework for that. So I don't think it's very helpful. Um, it does show intellectual humility, which I think on debatable issues is important. But another intellectual virtue is courage and honesty when we, have, when we discover there's in, maybe inconsistencies in our, in our Christian beliefs. In other words, we, we have these claims of the gospel that's exclusive, but also uh, we have uh, a good and a righteous judge for God. And, the, and then we have these people who never hear the gospel, right? So there seems to be some tension. And we want to be able to... Uh, investigate that and have an answer that harmonizes that. And also, don't you just hate a pat answer? And I feel like what, what we often give people is just like a pat answer. Very, very elevator pitch or kind of hand wave away. So what we want to stay away from on issues like this that are very complicated is we want to give people a pat answer. So inclusivism is the view that salvation is possible apart from hearing the gospel. 
That would be inclusivism. We're going to talk about it. Postmortem evangelism is that the unevangelized will hear the gospel after they die. They'll hear about Christ after they die. Universal evangelism would be before death, and that just is the view that God ensures the gospel gets to those who are seeking. Um, universalism, we kind of talked about, ultimately everyone, including the unevangelized, will be saved and hell will be emptied. That goes along with the uh, uh, view of hell. The final option view is that the unevangelized hear the gospel at the moment of death, not after death, but right at the moment of death, they have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. Um, the middle knowledge view has kind of two, two, uh, ask, two views. Uh, either one, if you know what, does anyone know what middle knowledge is? It's what God has uh, foreknows what his what free creatures will do in any circumstance. So God, on this view, God has so ordered the world with his middle knowledge, what he knows, that those people who never hear the gospel are those who would not have accepted Christ anyway. Okay. Um, the other part of a middle knowledge view would be those who say God will save those who would have accepted Christ if they heard about him kind of the two, two sides of that coin for the middle knowledge view. Okay, so let's get down to business. The three that we're going to look at are inclusivism, postmortem evangelism, and universal evangelism. And they, they, all of these views have two boundary beliefs in common. So they all would affirm that Jesus is the only Savior, and they all affirm that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Okay, so just keep that in mind. They're not they're they're in agreement on these two basic Christian claims. Now, how we're going to go through this? This is our model. This is our roadmap tonight. We're going to discuss the view, explain it in a nutshell. We're going to give key scriptural support. That's on your handout. Theological assumptions that they use to interpret scripture, that's on your handout. Ancient and modern proponents, so who's been for this view? Who has settled on this view in the past and now? And then we're going to, disc then we're going to talk about, well, what's, what are the strengths of this and the weaknesses of this view? And then we're going to, um, we're going to apply each one to a biblical account the biblical account of Cornelius. So Cornelius is in Acts 10, and I like him because we can, at the end of each view, we can figure out how they're going to apply their view to Cornelius. So remember, uh, do, do, do you, um, have you read Acts 10 lately? So I like Cornelius, don't you? He's one of my favorite. Okay, I'm just gonna summarize. I'm not gonna read the whole passage. Just to refresh your memory, because y'all had no, y'all have no idea who Cornelius is. That can't be. Y'all know who Cornelius is, right? Okay, yes. Okay, thank you, Sam. Okay, so Cornelius was a Roman centurion, and he lived in Caesarea. And he was a God-fearing Roman. So he feared God. Whatever he knew about God, he accepted it. And he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And one day while he was praying, an angel of God came to him and said, Cornelius, God hears your prayers and God remembers your gifts to the poor. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Peter. So he sends men to Joppa where Peter's stay, staying with Simon the Tanner in, in Joppa. And Peter didn't really understand at this time, remember that, he, that the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles. But God sends three visions to him as he's sitting on the top of his roof, uh, napping. And also the Holy Spirit convicts him that he should go with these men and share the gospel with Cornelius in Caesarea. So he goes. 
And Peter gets there and he hears the whole story of Cornelius, his, his life, that he fears God and that this angel came to him and told him to send for Peter. And Peter says this, um, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And after he says this, he shares his eyewitness testimony of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension with Cornelius and the whole household there. And they were all saved, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were baptized. Okay? So that's it. Do you remember it now? Okay. So we like Cornelius, and we're going to come back to him after each explanation. So let's talk about exclude Now, I told you the three we're going to discuss, but the first one, first one we have to discuss is the traditional view, which is exclusivism. Or you might call it restrictivism. It's really the traditional uh, view. And so in a nutshell, to be saved, it's necessary to know about the saving work of Jesus and explicitly exercise faith in him before you die. And the means of salvation is exclusively through human messengers. You've got to hear it from someone. So on your, on your um, handout, you've got the scripture support for the traditional view. Of course, it would be John 14, 6. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Actually, all the views would, would hold that uh, verse to be true. Uh, Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing the good news and people hear the good news when someone tells them about Christ. And then Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for men once to die and after this comes judgment. Now, the, the next thing, they, they have a view about general revelation. So in Romans 1, 18 through 20, we know that God says, uh, it cl should be clear to all men from general revelation, from the works of creation, that God exists, but people suppress the truth. People don't, don't believe general, they don't ponder general re revelation or they just suppress the truth about God's existence. But still they should have known because it's clear. So uh, Paul tells us in Romans, so they're without excuse. And in Romans 3.11, he goes further to say, no one understands, and actually, no one seeks God. So those are kind of the framework for the traditional view. And the assumptions, like on your handout, is that Jesus is the source and it, it, the ontological source and the epistemological necessity for salvation. What that means is Jesus is the source of salvation, but you also have to know Jesus. You have to explicitly have faith in Jesus. That's the epistemology. You have to know it. And then general revelation is not salvific. It can't save you. And it only condemns. But let's, let's, uh, let's talk about general revelation just for a second, just so we have a clear understanding um, what it is. So uh, I think I have that on your handout. General revelation is that God clearly reveals himself through the works of creation, and he gives us the rational capacity to understand certain things, certain concepts even about God, like eternality, that it, there's such a thing as eternal or necessary or contingent. We have these concepts uh, that from our rational capacity as human beings. And then we also have, so that... That's, uh, God gives us external knowledge, you know, of the world, things in the world that we can infer God from, but also gives us inside information, which is moral knowledge, is available that, that reveals our own sin to us. So we have outside information and inside information that God gives us that's all part of general revelation. And not only that, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin of unbelief in God. That's his ministry and work in the world. And so if you've been in the foundations class, who's in the foundations class? So you've been studying 
um, natural law arguments a lot. And you will continue. And the one, the one this week is the moral argument, right? So natural law arguments begin with observable facts from general revelation and argue to the existence of God. So do you, is that a little bit clearer about what general revelation is? It's not just that there's trees outside. Oh, there's a God. It's, it's, more, it's a little bit more than, uh, than that, that what God gives us. Okay, uh, so the pros and cons of the traditional view, certainly it stresses Jesus is the only Savior, and it emphasizes evangelism because no one's hearing it unless someone tells them the gospel, right? That's the Great Commission. So it definitely emphasizes missions. And, but the, the con is that salvation is not available to unreached people, to un, the unevangelized. So salvation is not universally accessible or offered to people. So what about, okay, okay so that, that's kind of a general pros and cons of the traditional view, which is, which is what led to Alvin's objection, right? What about the unevangelized? Um, Cornelius, Um, so Corn for, for our application to, for Cornelius, he was saved after responding to the gospel, right? Had he died before Peter arrived, because, you know, he had to send for Peter and then Peter came. Had he died before Peter arrived, he would have gone to hell on this view, right? Okay, so that's how we would apply it to, to poor Cornelius. Okay, so... Our next view is inclusivism, very different from exclusivism. And this view in a nutshell is that God saves people certainly because of the work of Jesus Christ, but it's not necessary to know the gospel message on this view. One must respond in faith to God as revealed through general revelation, just like we just talked about, before you die. Okay, so you've got your scripture support on your handout. Um, the, the ones that they use the most are Hebrews 11.6, the one who has faith, that's the faith uh, chapter, Hebrews 11. Um, the one who has faith must believe God exists and that he rewards seekers. And then there's lots of verses they quote for you will seek me and find me. In other words, God's, saying, God's giving a promise. If you seek me, you will find me. Luke 15, um, all the parables that illustrate God loves you and seeks the lost, like the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, all of those, right? John 16, 8 is about the Holy Spirit's work in the world, drawing people to, to God, to seek God, by convicting them of God's existence through, you, and so we're talking about unreached people that don't have the gospel. So, so what, is, what is the Holy Spirit using when he's trying to draw, when drawing people to himself? He's using general revelation to uh, draw people to seek God. And then Acts 10, Cornelius the centurion responded in faith to the light he had. They really liked that story. And uh, also they do, do go, you know, this is the one view that, that um, is kind of e the unreached people now are very equivalent to Old Testament people. Okay, so they're kind of e equating them. None of the other views do that, but this one does. So Old Testament believers that believed apart from special revelation didn't know Jesus, right? Uh, Job, Melchizedek, Jethro, Rahab. Can you think of others? There are others. These are the main ones that they use. So let's look at the assumptions. They're on your sheet, too. Um, so you... Jesus is necessary, but you don't have to know him, basically. That's the assumption they have. And seekers, those who seek God, will find him. So left to ourselves now, 
we don't see God. That was the Roman, the Romans three passage, right? Left to ourselves, we none of us seek God. But we're not. We're talking about that the Holy Spirit is is at work in the world. So we would say He's drawing people to seek God. Um, on this view, general revelation is salvific. So um, remember, on exclusivism, general revelation can't save you. But on this view, general revelation is salvific when a person responds in faith to the light they have in general revelation. They make a distinction, and you'll, so you'll hear this, in being a believer and being a Christian. So a believer... Um, so believers versus the Christian teachers. Believers without knowledge of Christ are saved because they have faith in God. These believers will awaken in the next life to discover who it is that saved them. Okay, they're still saved. The blood of Christ has to save them, but they don't know. They don't know who that is. Are you following me? Um, so the other thing that's interesting about their assumptions is that God is at work redemptively in other religions. So uh, if you do you read missionary biographies at all, anybody? It's not popular, I guess. It was very popular when I was young, but anyway. Um, so there's a missionary, Don Richardson, and he has many accounts that he writes about um, going to unreached people groups, tribes, at, only to find that God had been at work in them already, already giving them concepts in, uh, to be receptive to the gospel the minute that he told them about Jesus. So it's very interesting. And uh, he would just say, God hasn't been sitting idly by waiting for missionaries to bring the gospel to unreached peoples. He's at work in those tribes. Um, C.S. Lewis is, was an inclusivist. And um, so he, if, have you read The Last Battle, the Narnia book? Okay, so do you know Emmeth, the character, right? So that would be C.S. Lewis's way of saying that Emmeth was saved by his faith, even though he was ignorant of the true nature of uh, Aslan, of God. Um, Emmeth had a post-mortem enc encounter with Christ, and it wasn't to offer him salvation, but to inform him who it was that saved him. Okay, so that's C.S. Lewis dipping this inclusivism in a story, right? Um, also, if you've ever read The Great Divorce, there's hints of this in, in The Great Divorce, right? Okay, so you've got your ancient and modern, modern proponents. There's quite a few, actually. It, I, I, this isn't even all of them. So do any of these surprise you? That's on your handout. Okay. Here's a, here's a quote I have from an inclusivist, and I, I just found this helpful, and I'll, I'll see if you think it's helpful. This is about inclusivism. The unreached will be judged on quite a different basis than those who have heard the gospel. God will judge the unreached on the basis of their response to his self-revelation in nature, in general revelation, and conscience. The Bible says that from the created order alone, all persons can know that a creator God exists and God has implanted the requirements of his moral law in their hearts so that they are held morally accountable to God. So the Bible promises salvation to anyone who responds in faith to God's self-revelation. And that's an interpretation of Romans 2.7. Does that help? You see where they're coming from? Um, the strength is that God saves people based on the work of Christ, but it provides an account of salvation as universally offered to all in this life. Because general revelation has always been available, right? Not special revelation, but general revelation. So um, that's the universality of it. The weakness is it kind of undermines the gospel message because uh, it doesn't require conscious faith in Jesus. 
Does that, bo- <laughs> Does that bother you? These people are saved and they don't know Jesus? It's kind of strange. You kind of, hmm, I don't know about that. Um, so it's, it, it makes you think of Old Testament saints who believed in God but didn't know the promise, didn't know the name of the Messiah, right? They're, they're believing in the, in the future promised Messiah. Um, it also kind of undermines the motivation for the Great Commission and missions because people can be saved apart from responding to the gospel, right? And we think the Great Commission is pretty important. It's a command. So the fact that it undermines the Great Commission is a little, mm, don't know about that. But what about Cornelius? What about him? So Cornelius, on their view, was a believer. Remember, we talked about the distinction with faith in God before receiving the gospel. He became a Christian after Peter came and and gave him the gospel and he received it. So if he had died before Peter got there, he would still be saved. You got it? So if Peter didn't make it, Cornelius is still, still saved because he was a believer, even though he wasn't a Christian. Okay, so there's these distinctions. What do you think about that? So how are we doing so far, Katie? Well, I'm curious. Um, in like C.S. Lewis's story where the guy kind of comes to change, it seems like in that story he comes to realize that his God was actually Aslan all along. Does this, does this view hold that that has to happen at some point, maybe after death? Yeah. So, okay. yeah. That, and, and that's what they say. That uh, on, on the... In the No, they would say he already made his choice, and he's already received. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, there, but the postmortem evangelism is, is we're coming to next, which would be exactly that, the, the giving a choice after death. Yeah. Why did God send Peter to him if it wasn't necessary for him to be saved? Well, that's just on this view. So, yeah, obviously God thought it was necessary that he get the gospel and respond, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so that's a weakness in this view, well, right? You can also, that same argument goes for why does God, like, give the gospel, why does God leave anyone who has heard the gospel alive? Like, if, if you take that view, <coughs> then anyone who has any faith at all might as well immediately die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't want to kill Cornelius before. So he, he probably used Cornelius to spread the gospel. Well, yeah, he called a bunch of people to his household to hear the gospel, before, to hear Peter. So a lot of people got saved at that point, um, it says. Yeah, Landry. Does in, inclusivism still apply, say, uh, I don't know, a Muslim or a Jew who believes in a monotheistic God, but explicitly doesn't believe in Jesus? Does this still apply? Have they, it, that they've rejected Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, I, I don't know how they would handle that. But they do say that God is at work in all the, all the different religions. Now, I mean, I think that doesn't mean that all those people are saved. So um, it's, kind of, it's kind of like, it's almost as bad as agnosticism because you're saying you don't know what God is doing. And in, in God knows those people's hearts and, you know, um, whether their belief in in God counts for how they're um, participating in their religion, like like Emmeth in the last battle. Um, so there's a lot of problems with it, right? I would imagine this, the inclusivist camp is pretty broad, right? Uh, so there'd be disagreement about uh, a weak inclusivism and probably a strong inclusivism. Yeah, I mean, and can, you can see how many people hold to it. So they would have different, have nuances in their in their view, probably. So probably would depend on the person how they answer the question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, oh, what? Not in, not y'all. What? What? I have a good comment. No, he doesn't. I have a. I have a you have a good comment. He doesn't know my comment, so we can't know that yet. What's your comment, Michael? are focusing on the wrong thing with Cornelius about, well, 
that Cornelius needed the gospel and whatever. You know, people need the gospel because they're like dead in their sins and you need to like spread the good news of Jesus and you need to tell them about Jesus. That the goal of life on earth is not simply to get saved and go to heaven. You actually want, in inclusive say, yeah, you actually want to have like a relationship with Jesus. So of course you want to have a, a full throttle great commission yeah. to spread the word of Jesus because we want people to have a relationship with Jesus. The goal of your existence on earth isn't solely to get that salvation and be done with it. So True. You'd still want, just because it might be sufficient for Cornelius yeah. to be a believer, still much better. So actually, it wouldn't diminish the Great Commission because as a, as a missionary or as a believer, I would want those who don't have the gospel to have the gospel. Zach, were you going to say the same thing? Uh, I, I'm actually surprised that this will complement rather than contradict. <laughs> yes. I think, I think that the inclusivist would also say that this whole argument about, oh, well, this undercuts the Great Commission and, and whatnot, to use some good words, I think they would say people that are the normative way of salvation, like the normal way that people are saved, is through the gospel. And the, these people that are on the fringes, as it were, this is the exceptional. And so the inclusivist would push back and say, you're making a counter argument based on the existence of the exceptional to the to the normative, right? This is the whole. This is like the exact same argument with the whole like, oh, the thief on the cross didn't get baptized, therefore baptism isn't necessary, and all that stuff, right? Because it's arguing from the exceptional to then, oh, this affects our normative practice. Like, no, Jesus says, go ye therefore, teach all nations and baptize them. Ah, but the thief on the cross. That's ex those are exceptions. And this is t so much a fringe thing. We're talking about people who do not hear the gospel, right? So, yeah, not the norm. And not the norm of what, what, what Jesus was telling his disciples to do, right? Okay. Are we good? Let's go to the next one. Post-Mormon evangelism. And I, I remember when I first read about it, like this, I thought, there's no way I can agree with anything about this. But, you know, bear with me. Bear with me a little bit. So the view in, the nut, in a nutshell is that those who die without hearing the gospel receive an opportunity for salvation after death. Who was saved? Uh, that was your, right? No one is saved without explicit knowledge of Christ. So that's different from inclusivism, right? Because they said you could be saved without knowing Christ. This one is explicit knowledge of Christ is necessary. It's not a second chance view. So after death, you, if you've rejected Christ uh, in this life and you die, this is not a second chance for you. It's a first chance view. Those who never got the gospel and never heard of Jesus to respond. Only those who explicitly disbelieve in Christ will be, will be in hell. And also the, the, the offer on, on this view is not indefinite. It's not like forever you can decide whether you're going to accept or reject Christ. So do you know how this is different from uh, the traditional view? Because on the traditional view, people don't go to hell for disbelieving in Jesus that they never heard of. They go to hell for unbelief in God. That's on the, on the traditional view. Remember? Because there was uh, unevangelized go to hell, but they don't go to hell for not receiving Christ because they never heard about Christ. They go to hell because of unbelief in God. So this is a little bit different. Okay, so your, so your scriptural support is in your handout. Um, and this is just John 3.18, which is, again, uh, talking about he who believes in him is not judged. The believer's not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son. That's the scripture that they hang their hat on for only persons who explicitly reject Jesus will be condemned. And then um, they use 1 Peter 3.18 through 4.6. And this is the wonky, creepy verse where Jesus, after his crucifixion, uh, it's, uh, 
Peter says, Jesus went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. And we're going to talk about how they interpret that. But then the, the first Timothy verse is that God desires all men to be saved, which is true, true of the other views too. Okay, so what are their assumptions and what are they doing with the first Peter verse? Um, Jesus is both the source of salvation and you have to know it. So explicit knowledge in Christ. You can't not know Jesus. Uh, general revelation is not salvific on this view. It was for inclusivism, remember? Not on this view. General revelation is not salvific. Um, and unbelief is inexcusable. So the only person who explicitly disbelieves again in Jesus Christ will be condemned. And salvation on this view is universally accessible. Why is that? Because everybody, everyone gets a first chance even after death. If you've never heard of the gospel, you're going to get a chance to respond. And on this view, death does not seal your destiny. So what is this about Christ descended into hell and offered salvation to the dead? That's how they interpret the first Peter verse. And I'll just tell you that um, this is not a good interpretation of, of that verse. Um, so that's the big weakness in the postmortem view. It, it, if that's what they are using to say that there can be postmortem evangelism, um, I, I think that we, you know, there, there's a, they need to have a better scriptural basis for that. Um, because what, what we find, there's about five different interpretation of that first Peter passage. But Michael Heiser, if you've ever heard of him, probably has the best framework, supernatural worldview framework to, to interpret this. And so the two things you have to ask is, uh, who, are the, who are the imprisoned spirits and what was Jesus proclaiming, right? And on Heiser's view, the spirits, been in, and it's alluded to in Jude and in, in 1 Peter, that the spirits are those uh, divine beings that rebelled in Genesis 6. Do you remember the sons of God came to earth? They took on flesh and they had sex with all the beautiful women and had uh, terrible, they corrupted mankind and they had uh, giants for the Nephilim were their children. Now, it's kind of a wonky thing, but I mean, there, there's some co cohesive uh, um, context in it that Peter's picking up all the way here. He's referring to this Genesis 6. Who was with us last week at Forum to talk about Michael Heiser's view? Raise your hand. Okay, so everybody here who wants to, if you're really interested in this, see those raised hands? In afterthought, we can talk a long time about, yes, you can, Sam, talk <laughs> about Michael Heiser's view and why, th why, this, why this can't, you can't hang your hat on this for, for uh, Jesus uh, sharing the gospel with those spirits. Actually, what he was doing, his proclamation was that they were still defeated. They're still in chains. He, just because he is being crucified, he's about to be resurrected and he has the victory over them. So he's basically uh, pronouncing their doom, not saving them. So it's a completely opposite view of what, the, what these, this view would say. Um, what about strengths and weaknesses? Uh, it, it strongly affirms universally accessible salvation, right? Because everyone gets a first chance to receive the gospel even after death. So that's, it's got that going for it. Um, and they affirm the necessity of explicit faith in Christ. The weakness, as I said, is their interpretation of the first Peter passage. But what about Cornelius? So Cornelius was only saved after responding to the gospel. If Cornelius had died before Peter arrived, he would have had an opportunity in the afterlife to hear the gospel and respond, right? So that's Cornelius. Okay, Katie? There's at least like one pro of this view in terms of, 
like some of the first scriptures we read with exclusivism and things like that, that fits a little bit better within this view in the sense that you have to at some point. They hold a lot. That This one and exclusivism hold almost everything in common except for the, the, the afterlife, the, except for the postmortem evangelism. So, I mean, that gives you a little bit more support against maybe inclusivism where you don't have to believe in Jesus specifically. Right, right. Jet. Wouldn't this not only like de-emphasize the importance of missions, but actually make missions like counterproductive? Because wouldn't shouldn't they have more faith in God's ability to reveal Jesus to people after they die than our ability to try to? Yeah, I think it to- it totally diminishes the great com- the great commission. Like, I don't even think it diminishes it. I think it inverts it. It's like. It basically says, uh-huh. do not go. Yeah. And you have to think about, in the afterlife, is God able to make, that, make, make it so that you will freely accept or reject? So he's got it. There's something um, that we don't know. If this is the case, there's something we don't know, but God would have to make, make you make a free choice, right? Okay. We got to gotta move on. Here's the last one that we're going to go over, and it's universal evangelism. So this one is a little bit different, but the, in a nutshell, if people respond to general revelation, so this one is heavy about this, the role of general revelation is actually very, um, it's emphasized in this one. If people respond to the light they're given, to general revelation, by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, God will send the gospel message to them, whether by human messenger dreams, visions, or angels by any way he chooses. Okay? So you've got your scriptural support on your handout. Um, the one I would say, you know, you, you, th- those are very similar. The Holy Spirit draws people to seek God. Faith, you, you must have faith that God exists and he rewards seekers. God promises, if you seek me, you will find me. Um, the accounts of like the Ethiopian eunuch who was, didn't know what he was reading. And remember, Holy Spirit says, Philip, you got to go explain it to him. So he sends someone to explain to, to the Ethiopian eunuch. And X-10, and X-10 with, with Cornelius. And so this view does affirm that God sometimes gets things done by communicating directly through dreams, visions, without a human messenger. So, and we do find this in scripture, so I I don't have a problem with that. Um, The assumptions are both that Jesus is the source and you have to know Jesus. So you've got to get the God, the the unreached person, God's going to send the gospel message to them. General revelation is clear, but even on this view, it's not salvific. So it's not like inclusivism, right? Unbelief is inexcusable, and um, the Holy Spirit convicts all people. Uh, um, that's his job, and, the, and, and this grace is sufficient to bring about a person's search. So notice on this view, God is resi- responding to people who are seeking, and he's getting them the gospel. So when they respond to the light given to them, in general revelation, God will get them the, the gospel. Um, you've got your proponents there. The strength is explicit faith in Jesus is required and it offers universal access to those who are seeking, right? The weakness is it kind of de-emphasizes missions because God can use any way he sees fit. You know, like in Muslim countries where, where the Bible is not allowed, do you know that people often have dreams of Jesus coming to them, revealing himself to them personally in a, in a, vision, in a dream. Have you all ever read about things like that? It happens today, so I'm, I, I think that's very valid. Um, okay, what about Cornelius? What about Cornelius on this view? God ensured Cornelius received the gospel message because why? Cornelius had responded in faith to the light given. He was a God-fearing Roman, right? So that's just how they would explain Acts 10. I'm sorry, I've had a cold all week. Are y'all annoyed at my sniffing? 
Um, so which of the four responses do you think best reflects the claims of Christianity and the character of God? I'm not here to get to tell you. In fact, I, I, I jump around on all, all this. I hold these very loosely. I don't, I'm not very dogmatic on this question. Um, but what we did do, we evaluated each view. We saw what scripture they use, but also you can't just go by that. You have to know what are they assuming that interprets the scripture. So they have assumptions that they use in their framework, in their systematic theology, to interpret certain scriptures a certain way. And then we looked at some strengths and weaknesses, the proponents, and then the application to Cornelius. So do you think you, have, you would have a better response to Alvin after this? And wouldn't, wouldn't that be more interesting to him than just to say, we just don't know? Even though we don't know, and you can still say that, right? But you can say, here are some responses over the millennia of, of uh, answers to this question. Um, so what you want to do is uphold the claims of Christianity about the exclusive nature of the gospel, the goodness and justice of God, and the destiny of the unevangelized. Those are the things you want to pull together for Alvin so that he's not so panties in a wad about this objection, right? So just remember, this is your one takeaway. When evaluating debatable issues, and there are many, Christianity in Christianity, it's important to consider and evaluate the assumptions that guide the interpretation of key, strip, key scriptures that support their view. Whatever view you're looking at. Okay? Everybody got that? And then, our, you know, what we want to do, what our aim in talking to Alvin is, we want to give him intellectual permission to consider the gospel by thoughtfully answering his objection. And I hope that, that you understand that that's very valuable to Alvin so that he might then consider the gospel after you give him a very thorough response to his objection. Now, we didn't talk about a lot of stuff, so this, we, we kind of narrowed it down. What about the unevangelized before Christ? What is the role and importance of general revelation? We talked about it, but we could discuss it some more. What about infants who die and the mentally disabled? This is, a, this, this is also a problem that's been discussed uh, for millennia. And how does your view of hell inform your response regarding the fate of the unevangelized? Those are things we can talk about over there. Okay? Any, anything more? I mean, we're almost out of time, but if you, anybody have a um, comment, questions, clarification, are you, are, do you feel better? Do you feel worse? You go, oh my gosh, there's too many views. Do you feel better or worse? Better? Good.